listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. Way we go. We are back. Welcome back, Leatherhead Nation, to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. This is the only one that brings the firehouse kitchen table. You know that table, right, Roof? It's a big it's, table. Oh, man. It holds the weight of a thousand stories for crying out loud. That's what it does. It's a big table. It is. It is. It What's transcends happening? All too. You know that, right? We're talking I'm, about it. I'm very happy for you. I'm excited again for this, uh, for these types of shows. Hey, maybe we'll smart you up a little bit. You know I'm smart, I mean? Mikey. I can't find that one. I got to look for that one in this summer. <laughs> I was just spent the last, I don't know how long here looking for it. <laughs> I'm smart, Mikey. It. The, 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 chief, the chief liked that one, right? He said yeah. he liked that one. I'm smart, Mikey. Not like everybody says. I'm smart. So, uh, yeah, Kooby Coops. Hooked, uh, we got Chief Jay Jonas again to do a back in the day. We were, uh, this one we're going to do, we're going back to 1876. I think uh, Hank just got out of probie school then, bro. In that year, <laughs> I believe. You know, while we, there's two guys we turn to for history, right? Only two guys you can turn to the, the goat. The goat. Oh, you mean this guy here? He ain't going to get it. There's no way he's getting it. I'm, I'm going to find it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All and right, of course, the guy over here in the corner, Chief Steve. He's a he's a Manhattan buff too. So he originally wanted to do this. He called me a couple of weeks ago because I wanted to go do the uh, uh, Smoky Joe uh, Chief uh, uh, thing, like we did with um, Boss Tweed. Tweed. And he's like, "Hey, why don't we do? Why don't we do the Brooklyn Theater Fire?" I'm like, "Ah, oh, it sounds good, man." You go down to the Rock Library where I spend a lot of my nerdy time now. And the first thing I open is this, this guy right here. And he so had sent that to me too. Text. I don't even think I even looked at it. Actually, I to sent be my brother a text. I said, somebody beat you to it there, Spanky. Sorry. <laughs> Moving along. It's really not well done either. You know. No, 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 no. It doesn't get in depth. There's not a whole lot of pictures here. <laughs> no, yeah. you can't really follow it along. It's 34 times. pages. I read it yeah. cover to cover. Like, you can't even believe. Yeah, it's good stuff. This, Again, that happened in the in this city. You could do all this time on the job and know nothing about this job at all. Yep, it's crazy. Well, I was talking to uh, this is uh, actually the last night for uh, unfortunately uh, until we meet Bob. again for our producer Bob. Uh, he'll be back though after he straightens some shit out. Uh, but we were talking about this early on how how we are really hooked on this history thing now and how uh, and Mike said something he stole my thunder for crying out loud. But good, good oh I said his name. Bob. Good thing, uh, Bob. Bob said, "He said if you get it, if you're gonna have a, a time machine, I was thinking about that, right, Ruff? Like, let's if you go back, any point out any any time, and go right to the firehouse kitchen table. Go back to 1969 with a brother sitting in there watching the Amazons win the World Series. Go back to the 40s where they're talking about a Hitler bro at the table. No matter what time you bring up, the brothers were talking about what was going on, right?" You know what's so funny is when I, I worked in Squad 18 quite a bit, and they wanted a few firehouses that has the spiral staircase still in the kitchen, right? That mm -hmm. goes up to the second floor. I think it goes to the third floor, actually. And uh, <clears throat> my brother-in-law was my brother-in-law this week and uh, this weekend, and he said to me, he goes, hey, Lou, you know what? I found something out because he's an architect. He's like, you know why they have spiral staircases in the firehouse? I said, of course I know why they have spiral staircases in the firehouse. So he's like, really? So I said, yeah. So because of the horses, they used to walk up the stairs. So I said, every time I came, not not every firehouse I did that, but that particular firehouse, when you walk down those stairs, mm -hmm. you just feel like you're in history. Walking back in right. time. Right. Really, I mean, think yeah. about how many guys have, you know, it's got to be 100 years old, right? Obviously, whatever the firehouse is, oh, now, yeah. I don't know, it's over 100 years old. But think about how many guys came down those stairs over the yeah. years. I mean, if you look at an old building, let's say, let's take a church, for instance. Are they filled 24-7, you know, 365 days a year, every year for the past 100 something? There's been somebody sitting in that firehouse every single day Not for that, that amount of time over history. Mm -hmm. So imagine the conversations that you could have had at that kitchen table. That's why there's no other place on earth like the firehouse kitchen table. Well, there's, there's, other, there's other, you know, places where they have the kitchen table now you could find on the Like what? Podcasts and stuff like that now they have. Oh yeah, not that. Not, 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 well, yeah. well, <laughs> come on, let's not go there. Right? But this is, after all, the self-proclaimed best fire department, maybe the best podcast in the whole wide world. I right, like let's get to a little bit of business. We got a new, we got a new sponsor, Bob. Bob made a terrific commercial. 
Right, Bob? It's an old but new sponsor. I see the look of, of absolute abject fear. Bob's like, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the new commercial we made for the that new, not-so-new company that came out in 2014. Mm -hmm. So I don't got to stutter like an idiot while I'm reading it. Bob? Bob? If you're looking for a gift for that special firefighter in your life, then head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Yes, GettingSaltyApparel.com. What do we have? Well, we carry hand-drawn original t-shirts, glassware such as mugs, shot glasses, pint glasses, engraved Arctic cooler cups, and much, much more. There's also a full line of firefighter tool bottle openers like Halligan's, Nozzles, and wine bottle opener accesses too. And if you're a cigar smoker, congratulations! We have partner saw cigar cutters and humidors. Think we're done? Far from it. We got toiletry, gear bags, poozies, a full line of hats, decals, sweatshirts, and once again, so much more. We can also personalize most of these products. And if you want discounts, hey, you've come to the right place. We got discounts on large orders for promotion dinners, weddings, as well as installation dinners. Just head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. That guy is talented. He's you think we're close. done? Not even close. No, not even close. <laughs> when I first brought up the commercial, he's like, oh, my God, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's play the real commercial. So we can bring the chief in here so he's not sitting back there while we act like two idiots. Uh, so let's get our New Jersey fire from our boy Jimmy. Jimmy the game. Established in 1930 and under the current ownership since 1987, the New Jersey Fire Equipment Company handles a complete line of fire department equipment and supplies. Headquartered in Greenbrook, the company operates full 3M Scott service facilities in Ridgefield Park and Toms River, staffed by 10 fully authorized Scott certified technicians with a fleet of six fully equipped service vans. All New Jersey fire technicians and sales representatives are active or retired firefighters, officers or chief officers, career and volunteer. They understand the business and the importance of their work. New Jersey Fire has represented Scott since Earl Scott entered the SCBA business at the end of World War II. Among other leading manufacturers represented by New Jersey Fire are Globe and Firedex Turnout Gear, Mercedes Hose, Task Force Tips and Akron Brass, Hygienol, Fire Hooks, Arctic Compressors, MSA Carnes Helmets, ChemGuard Foam, Alkalite and Duo Safety Ladders, BA Face Shield Protectors, Truckman's Choice Saws, Groves gear racks and washer dryers, SuperVac fans, RPI, Streamlight, and many others. A New Jersey incorporated and based company, sales and service are limited to the state of New Jersey. Find us now at www.njfe.com. That's www.njfe.com. Back, throwback uh, Mondays. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob, pull up that one comment from Patty Lee. I almost wet myself reading that. Did you see that one, Ruffy? I did. <laughs> <laughs> yum, yum. You burn, you burn that church down. They never let you forget it, bro. That should be our next episode. The Great Masters <laughs> Church Fire of 2007. <laughs> or another great 288 scene. What's there now? I don't even think they ever built anything. <laughs> I can tell you what's not there. That's the church. <laughs> a 150-year-old church? 150-year-old church that we burned down to the foundation. Um... But hey, we tried, right? <laughs> All right, Ruffy, so let's do it so I can focus on the boys. We'll do a little something different in there. You're going to bring in a guest, and I'm going to right here. We're going to bring in a goat. We're going to bring in this guy, and I'm going to get ready for – oh, almost did it again. Go ahead. Bring him in. All right. Uh, Brooklyn Theater Fire from 1876 expert, Chief J. Jonas. Okay. There it is. There he is on short notice, too. Man, we yeah. – this was like bottom of the ninth, Ruffy. The bases were loaded. We had to call in – we had to call in the – Towel ladder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need a towel ladder in here. Chief, we went to a fire one time at a hundred-something-year-old church. What's this Patty, wee stuff? You got a mouse Patty in the Lee, Patty Lee lives, happens to live next door, and I might have plowed over his garbage cans, and he never lets me forget it. So <laughs> – It was my old <laughs> lieutenant, 124. Yeah. So if you guys want to have something read out loud, you know the whole shtick. We got to make another commercial now for the Super Chat. Short one. Super Chat. All right. Before we get on with it, there you go. Thank you, uh, Bob. Michael Bob. Uh, let's get patriotic because I know the Chief is a patriotic fellow. So let's do our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There we go. Chief, again, thank you for coming on such short notice. Um, so if you would, maybe just turn back the hands of time. Bring us back to the late 1800s, not too soon after the Civil War, and fill us in on the great Brooklyn theater fire. All right. Well, the New York City Fire Department went paid in uh, right, right around the end of the Civil War in 1865. So... Uh, this was not that long after that. Um, the date of the fire was December 5th, 1876. It was uh, the, the Brooklyn Theater. Uh, it was in the corner of Johnson Street and Washington Street, which is now Cadman Plaza. If you drive on the BQE, you see exits for Cadman Plaza. That's where this happened. Um, the play that was, that was being shown that night, it was a Tuesday night, middle of the week was a play called Two Orphans, and it was starred uh, some big actors at the time, Harry Murdoch and Kate Claxton. Uh, this was a, a monumental event. 278 people were killed. You know, uh, we were, we, a few weeks ago, we talked about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Flyer, and that was 146. And uh, this was a few decades earlier, and... Uh, uh, that many people were killed. What What was the Slocum, Chief? How many people did we lose on that? Slocum was over a thousand. We uh, lost over a thousand people on the Slocum. Yes. Oh wow! We we'll have to do that one next. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. That was wow. a bad one. Now this th this theater had had the possibility of. I mean, it was a big theater, right? It hold it would hold close to sixteen hundred people, right? But it was not full that night. Right, it wasn't full. It was about two thirds full. Uh, this. Uh, this opened in October 2nd, 1871. So the, by when the time the fire came, this building was only five years old. It, was, it wasn't that old. Um, it was of class three construction, which is brick and wood joists, for those of you who don't know. And the dimensions were 70 by 121. It was L-shaped. The building was L-shaped. And um, uh, exposure one, the front of the building was Washington Street. That's where the lobby of the uh, of the theater was, and uh, you also had Johnson Street, which is where the other the L um, met the met the street. Um, the um, in this, inside the building, there were um, two balconies and an orchestra level, which they call the parquet. The parquet could seat 600 people. The, uh, the first balcony was also called the, uh, the dress circle, which could seat 550. And the second balcony, the cheap seats, was called the family circle, and it could seat 450. It was, you know, and again, this is a key time in our history as, as far as uh, what was invented yet, what was not invented. Well. These buildings weren't electrified yet. Uh, they were illuminated by gas lights in cages, which could be shut off remotely. And um, Washington Street was the main entrance. Exposure 4 was the Brooklyn Police Precinct, first precinct. It was right next door to the theater. And Exposure 4A was a post office. Well, you could see that in the picture there, in one of those pictures there on your timeline there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, there was a hotel nestled in the hollow of the L um, called the Dieter Hotel. Exposure three was Floods Alley. Uh, and there were four doors leading to Floods uh, Alley. And on the other side of the alley from where the theater was, was uh, row frame buildings. So you can see what, what's about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> right. you know, major fire in a row frame buildings, it doesn't... Uh, it's not good. No, it can't be a good sign. Uh, and, and none of that is there today, right? Cabinet Plot. That's all. No, just it's a big park. Up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I went there. Um, we spoke it before. I went there one day when I was researching this fire. And uh, 
just to kind of get an idea where some of these things were. And I, I like to walk the, uh, the area and visit the site that I'm writing about. And I went to Pierpont Street, which is where Engine 5 was, and uh, th that building's gone. But, uh, you know, I walk Cadman Plaza and says, well, it happened right here where I'm standing. This is, Nobody knows, right? This People is the walk by it every day. Or throwing hamburger wrappers there, you know, and uh, they had no idea the, the drama that unfolded there in 1876. Um, a uh, construction feature of this building, which would which would lead to the death of many people, where there, there were two stairways leading to the, the dress circle balcony, the lowest balcony. And there was only one stairway leading to the family circle balcony. Uh, and it, you had to go to the dress circle balcony to get to that stairway. So you had all these people in the cheap seats and they were... Um, there's only one way for them to get out, and they were high. They were high in the uh, in the theater. So when the fire, excuse me, when the fire did happen, these are the people that were engulfed by the smoke and the heat uh, first. Um, there was a uh, a large door and a small smaller door off the stage, which led to um, the the uh, floods alley. That would pay play a key part in spreading the fire, these, these, especially the large door. There was an underground passage from, the, uh, from behind the stage to the box office. You could go underneath the, uh, the theater itself and you could go, go to the box office right from the stage and not have to go through the, uh, the audience. Uh, the stage had canvas on three sides of the building and the ceiling. There were numerous painted canvases in the flies of the stage. The flies are what, what's hanging from the ropes uh, behind the stage. And uh, a lot of those uh, painted canvases were from other places. They were just being stored there. Uh, the stage had a standpipe and it was not used at the fire. The theater was about two thirds full. And uh, like I said, the, uh, the family circle, balcony, the cheap seats, they were full. There was 400 to 450 people in in that balcony. And they were mostly young men, right? According to that thing? Mostly men, yeah. Between 18 and like 25 or something like 23, that? 23, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, all right, the, uh, let's talk about the Brooklyn Fire Department. Uh, was City of Brooklyn was not part of New York City at the time. The Brooklyn uh Brooklyn had its own fire department and it went paid on November, I mean, um, September 15th, 1869. So four years after Manhattan went paid. Uh, in uh, 1876, the year of the fire, they had 40 fire companies and eventually they would merge with the FDNY on January 28th, 1898. Um, the chief of department was a man named Thomas Nevins. He was the second chief of department um, of the Brooklyn Fire Department. The first chief of department uh, left after a year, and Thomas Nevins took it after that. And he was uh, 27 years old at the time of the fire, so a pretty young wow. chief of department. Yeah. You can actually see BFD on some firehouses that are still around. I think like like 236 has it, right, Roof? There, there yeah, 236, 252 has it. Oh, they do. Right, right. 252 has them. some of the old firehouses still have the BFD emblem on it. I love that. Yeah. Um, that guy looks a hell of a lot older than 27. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> they don't make them out. like they used to. That's for sure. <laughs> the fire aged them. Huh? Yeah. Chief, you don't see a man bun on that guy, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no man bun. Hell of a mustache, though, man. Yeah. The... Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Brooklyn Fire Department, that they were alerted to fires by telegraph. However, there are no alarm boxes in Brooklyn. So if somebody wanted to report a fire, they had to go to the closest police precinct. Oh, my goodness. Great. And report it to the, report it, the, uh, the fire to the uh, pr police precinct. And um, <laughs> then they, the, the police precinct would transmit the uh, signal to City Hall. Oh and my somebody God. from City Hall would uh, <laughs> transmit the box to the appropriate district where the fire was. 
So, so that had a like pretty a good 20... head. So I had a pretty good head start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that has to be about a twenty minute. By the time Holy somebody shit. saw it, got over they... to the police precinct. Yeah, they they said that one in ten people in Brooklyn knew how to notify the Brooklyn Fire Department. <laughs> oh that my many, huh? god! <laughs> they said it took twenty to thirty minutes to notify the Brooklyn Fire Department. Yeah, there you go. Wow. So burned it, burned it down. Uh, yeah, you see, Patty, that's what happened to us. That, that <laughs> night, <288. laughs> we had a little delay. A little delay, the response. <laughs> Imagine yeah. that we burned it down with with a two-minute response time. and uh... <laughs> Fire coming out the steeple. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the apparatus, it, it was, you know, unlike you know, what we talked about Triangle a couple of weeks ago, Um <clears throat> Was was all horse horse drawn? It was one hundred percent horse drawn. The engines were uh, had a, a steamer and a hose wagon, and the the area the hook and ladder apparatus was horse drawn as well. Unlike Triangle, it didn't have an aerial device. It was just uh, uh, this trailer with uh, a massive load of portable ladders. When when did those come into effect? About do we know, Chief? The uh, aerials? I really don't. I don't know. Ah, who I was, I, I I was at the turn of the century, if if I had to guess. Um, wow, look at that. So uh, yeah, you know it. Um, Cobblestone streets. What was that engine? Brooklyn engine six. Brooklyn engine six, which would be. Did you want to talk to them about how uh, the Brooklyn companies got numbered? Yeah, yeah. How uh, when they went from uh, Brooklyn, you know, and they added the. Uh, the numbers to get to where they are today right they uh well the, like i said the, uh, in 1876 there were 40 fire companies in brooklyn and uh so if it was a, a brooklyn company they uh they, they would put the numeral two in front of their company number and that's how they numbered them uh and the same is true with the uh, the air uh the ladder companies the hook and ladder companies they would uh insert the number one in front of them so, so uh, six would become 206 right did they yeah. add 200 yeah they added 100 and 100 i think if i remember yeah. right yeah which was interesting to me because what the uh the first two ladder company was uh was ladder company three and uh we all know them as ladder 103 in east new york so, you know Holy so I didn't they're, know prob that. they're probably their uh their initial location was down in this area you know, I have to look that up. The second um, ladder company was 102. And, you know, 102 is a lot Because yeah, the ladders, they did 50 and 50, if I remember right. <clears throat> they did 50 first, and then they did another 50. So it became a three would have became. Right. Yeah, that's, that's why right. you see, we were talking about 16 truck. It was 66, right? Or something like that, you said? And then 116. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the one on, on Queens Boulevard became 66. Yeah. But it never, it never. They never moved. They never moved it, so it stayed sixty six until whereas... they went to the other quarters, and they became one sixteen. Yeah. Yes, correct. Right. So one hundred three. Never heard of those guys. <laughs> I think I got it on. I do. You do, poster. <laughs> there you go. That's all right. How fortuitous. <laughs> and uh, all right, this massive fire started at um, twenty three fifteen hours. Um. The play was in its final act, and uh, no it, was shit. Started, it was started by guys lowering scenery, and they came in contact with one of the gas lights. And, wow, they didn't they didn't figure that uh, they got to keep that away from the the gas lights, man. The big I curtain. Guess they know now. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one thing that said asbestos curtain. What is that, Chief? A little uh, a curtain made of asbestos to help the, the stop the fire spread. Curtain? The, there's a prosendium curtain which came came about as of the, because of this, ah. and it was designed to separate the stage from the audience. So, um, but the uh, it, it, as most major fires, it kind of started innocently. You know, the uh, people started seeing sparks dropping onto the stage, and that they they thought it was part of the show. You know, they didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Right, and uh, then you know things started to to uh, take off a little bit, and some somebody yelled out "fire, fire, fire," and the orchestra kept playing 
to keep about 900 people calm, uh, which was like the Titanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keep playing. <laughs> keep playing. I was just gonna say that. Keep playing. <laughs> well, that's kind of what Good they one, did, Steve. right? They, they, didn't the actress try to calm people down, right? Yeah, and yeah. Nothing to see here. Though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, fire could be seen coming over the heads of the actors. Now, um, two events took place that greatly exacerbated this this incident. You know, the, the stage crew, you know, in, in, backstage, they were looking to get out. They opened up that large door off the stage. Holy shit. That fronted on Johnson Street. And they left it open. And there was a strong breeze blowing. And it fanned the flames for the... Um, uh, going right at the going right at the audience. Right at, right at the audience. Yeah. Holy was that, shit. Was that Murphy again? And yeah, another... Know major event that that really made this incident uh terrible was that you know i the uh, the gas lights could be controlled remotely you know you, you they had a, some sort of a valve that could shut off the gas door. oh no so they shut the lights off so they shut the gas, the gas off, off. That, oh we're doing a good thing here we're, it's we're pitch black turn it off the fire now with the smoke and now people were panicking before off. they are now <laughs> That there was, they were in pitch darkness. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, the, you know, people started to panic, and uh, the uh, this the actress, Kate Claxton, she was on stage at the time of the fire, and she yelled out for everybody to keep cool, you know, keep cool, you know, <laughs> and that worked for a little while, but then, you know, people started saying, "I have had it, you know, it's time to go." Yeah, I guess it's it's okay to panic as long as you're the first one to do it. You know, yeah, as long as you have a secret tunnel underneath, <laughs> yeah. don't worry about it. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and um, you know, they started. Uh, there she is, is Kate Claxton. I, you know, sounds like she was uh, one of the all-star actresses of her day. You know, and uh, um, you now all of a sudden, people started trying to get out, and. Uh, the um, the biggest problem was the balconies. You know, people trying to get out of the balconies, and the worst one was the uppermost one because they were falling oh, they down way, yeah. into the other balcony. So, like, they didn't have a direct egress out. So, uh, and we they all made know, the statement that heat bodies, rise, right? So they were they were in the worst place yeah. you could be. They were saying that bodies were starting to pile up like firewood. You know, I was thinking about that, Chief, when I first saw this, and, and I read a little bit in the beginning where you mentioned, you know, people thought it was part of the act, right? They thought it was initially. Yeah. And that was the same thing in that one in Connecticut. I think it was Connecticut in that, that oh, the, the, rock rock band? the rock band set right. up, the, set the stage off, the pyrotechnic set off the soundproofing or something. Right. And everybody, it, there's a video of it, right? Obviously, and you, and you see the people hanging around until... The guys on stage, they do the exit stage left out the back door. And then everybody starts running to the doorway. And then what happened was, and I was going to ask you maybe if you knew anything. I didn't see anything about it. If all the people running to the exit jammed up the exit like it did in that, you know. Uh, uh, well, there was a log jam of people in the lobby. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, there were four exits from the theater going towards Floods Alley. And every one of them was locked. Holy shit! And the uh, um, the head usher was named a man named Thomas Rockford. He went to open all the uh, locked doors opening out to Floods Alley, and he opened them by grabbing a uh, a crowbar that he saw at the post at the box office earlier in the night. And uh, he actually forced the door, so he he got one door open and. It, there was a flood of people that came in trying to use that door, you know, so there was a, a log jam of people there. People must have been trampled. Oh my God. There's no doubt about that. Well, well that's what happened at that, at that job. Yeah, they got trampled. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it's like people suspend, suspend belief, you know, they can't believe what they're seeing. You know, this, oh, this can't be happening to me. Right. Same thing happened at the at Boston's Coconut Grove fire. You know, this, this fire started taking off. 
and people are looking at it. You know, it was like, you know, somebody call a fire department. <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Uh, Let's get out of here. I think that for us, you know, we see things happening. We're reacting. Most, like you said, most people, if they don't, if it's never happened or if they've never seen it before, yeah. they get like frozen or something. Like uh, I would, I think, you know, you always think you would do something different in those stages. You know what I mean? Like. But. That's why it's so important to have automatic alarms in these places to take the human element out of it. Yep. You know, that's true. You know, so, you know, you get in a heavy smoke condition at the ceiling. Well, the, the fire department's just been notified, you know, that they're on their way, you know, and uh, it's not going to take 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, I remember going to a, uh, um, a class three alarm uh, at a nice hotel and, and uh, you know, people were annoyed that the, this alarm was going off. And, uh, uh, you know, it almost seems like the, the more affluent they are, the less likely they think. Yeah, us. right. That's true. <laughs> That's definitely true, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you here, fireman? You know? <laughs> <laughs> You better get low, brother. <laughs> All right. So uh, so Thomas Roquefort opened up one door. There was a Brooklyn Police Department patrolman on the scene. He, he was watching the show from the uppermost balcony, uh, the, uh, the family circle balcony, the second balcony. And uh, I, obviously that's, that must be uh, one of their posts that he, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was in the theater. And things started taking off, and he started to take charge. He sprang into action. People were grabbing at you know, I'm sure he had one of those long uh, woolen coats that the police officers wore at the time. Um, people were grabbing onto it. He took it off so he could get away from the people. He urged the people to go to the exits. You know, you know save yourself. Move. Go to the exits. And... Uh, at one point, he just he became exhausted, and he said out loud, he's quoted as saying, now I've done all I can, and he fell, he fell unconscious. His remains were found. Holy shit. Badly burned. And the only way they identified him was his trunching, which, which is his billy club, and his watch. His remains were removed to the yard of the first precinct which was, you know. Wow. Did that other guy make it out? The guy who opened up the doors with the crowbar? Yes. He's probably the he first did. one through. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah. He saw them coming. He yelled, yeah. I've done all I could do. Take yeah. care. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Here's Every your exit. for himself. <laughs> That's it, man. So, uh, Where's the now, lifeboat? Kate Claxton went to the back of the stage after she was trying to urge the people to uh of course she did to stay calm <laughs> she went backstage and she grabbed about three or four other people uh, actors and they took that underground tunnel to the to the uh box office in the front of the building and when they're traveling through this underground tunnel they could hear the mayhem going oh my off God. their heads that's and, uh, crazy yeah you, know, you could you could you imagine that and they they went not knowing if they could get out the other side. And once they got there, it was locked, but they were throwing their bodies against the door and they finally got out. Oof. But, uh, how did she get all, how did she, so she lived, right? Chief. Yeah. She lived. Yes. Yeah. How yep. do you, how do you, how do you live with yourself after, uh, you tell everybody to remain calm, you sneak out the back door and 250 people die because you told them to hang loose. Yeah. Well, it wasn't her, uh, it wasn't her fault. No, yeah. I know, but Actually, still. She, she she took an action to try to save him, you know. So uh, um, while this was going on, somebody finally ran next door to the first precinct and reported the fire. The oh, my God. This is still medical. going on. That's right. The fire department's not even there yet. They're not even notified. <laughs> no telephones, no alarm boxes. What a mess. The alarm was transmitted to City Hall. The Brooklyn Fire Department was notified of the fire. At 2320 hours, the fire was first uh, noticed at 2315, so five minutes. By 2330, the building was a mass of flames. So there you go, delayed along. There we go. So the same, the same lyrics to every song, delayed along. 
the Brooklyn and, police and locked are, doors too seems the, to be the uh yeah that was a common same, thing uh, common thing the Brooklyn Police Department started rescue operations uh you know there was the, the people that were in the precinct Sergeant John Kane Sergeant John Eason telegraph operator Thomas Cornell and detective Cornelius Maloney all entered the theater to try to free things up and try to get people out of the theater Engine 5 from 160 Pierpont Street was first due. They were led by Captain Thomas Burns, and his company stretched the hose line to the lobby on the, the lobby door on Washington Street. The first chief that arrived was, uh, they called him a district engineer, but that's a battalion chief, uh, was named Charles, Charles Farley. Uh, he entered the, the theater along with the... Uh, police officers from the first precinct uh, to perform rescues and they tried to free the log jam of people. At that time, they were piled up three to four feet high. Wow. Three to four feet high of stacked bodies. And, uh, you know, and everything is taken off right now. Um, they did actually clear the lobby and they, they, their focus was on the growing fire. They had to physically remove people as stairways and aisles were blocked by people panicking and stampeding. The uh, the police officers and the uh, and the chief climbed as high as they could and asked if anyone else was there, and nobody answered. Chief Farley and the rescuers were in danger of the encroaching fire. Um, I mean, I can't imagine what how much fire was there when they got there after they had that much. Uh... Let's well, and it was a class three building, so it was brick and wood joists, but really the, the whole interior was wood. You know, right. the balconies were all wood, you know, and uh, um, and you know, with lacquer and everything else. And, uh, you know, this was. Uh, oh, and this picture right here, Chief, that picture that that's yes. the precinct is right to the right. The exposure four side, correct? This is correct. Short. It's like a three story building. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, and yeah. the building to the right of that is the post office. Right. And so, why did they say, did they say why they never used the stair pipes? Because they had two and a half inch line on it, right? Was it ever addressed or spoken about? No. Mm -hmm. It was there, was it used? They had um fire pails and they, they were they were not used. Um so it's a, it's a question we may never know the reason uh, mm -hmm. for. Uh, Engine 6 was second due. They responded from their firehouse at 14 High Street, commanded by Captain Patrick Leahy. And they stretched the line to the lobby door. The fire was well advanced and sheets of flame sheets of flame and thick smoke were coming out of the building. So this was the second due engine. There's already sheets of flame coming out. Engine 7 was third due. Fire was becoming advanced. Uh, and their efforts were changing to prevent fire from jumping the street. This is the third dual engine, and they're, they're, they're thinking the fire's that's two oh seven. Fire's gonna 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 jump. Yeah, um, Washington Street. You know. Did it get into those row frames? Yes. It did. Yeah, yeah. Three truck was led by Captain Samuel Eustace. It was the only ladder company on the first alarm. They raised ladders to the roof of the theater hotel. Um, second alarm units arrived. Engine four was commanded by Captain Daniel Garrity, and they took their line to the roof of the post office. Um, Chief of Department Thomas Nevins arrived at 23, 26 hours. Uh, interesting how the bell system was wired to his house on Carroll Street. So any box that was transmitted was transmitted in his house. He got there and saw how serious the fire was, and he sent his driver to transmit a second alarm uh, at uh, Engine Five's quarters on Pierpont Street, and he ordered a third alarm a few minutes later. Uh, as second alarm units arrived, Engine Four was commanded by Captain Daniel Garrity. He took their their line to the roof of the post office. Engine 10 was third on the second on the command of John Cunningham stretched to Flood's Alley to protect the row frames from the approaching fire. And they couldn't stop it. You know, fire was coming that way. Um, two truck arrived on the second alarm. They and uh, two truck reached, uh, 
uh, three truck breached the wall of the theater, so hose lines could be deployed to that location. Um, interesting side story. A man named William Kerr, who was a clerk of the Brooklyn Health Department, spotted a man coming out of the coal chute on the sidewalk. This guy grabbed him and pulled him out. Another man was spotted behind him, and he was larger than the, the, the original guy, and he had a harder time pulling out, but eventually they did get him out. And uh, these two guys escaped by the coal chute. Uh, the, um, did, the, did the police precinct burn down too, Chief? No. Do you remember? No. No, it was, uh, and, and to, you know, they had no mention about the Dieter Hotel, which is also an immediate. Oh, that was right in the middle, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's amazing. Stretching lines and, and breaching walls. Basics, right? Even back in 1870-something. That's yeah. crazy. That's really yeah. crazy. Yeah. So Imagine um, the pump so, on that freaking thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, 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 imagine what that really looked like, the... Uh, Seeing the steam was hooked up to the hydrant. I've seen one one of those pumps. If you go on YouTube and you punch up, uh, you know, antique engine, and you watch that thing, like when they're shoveling coal in it and it's pumping water, it's comical almost. Like yeah. it's it looks like it's ready to explode at any minute. It's just like all this stuff. It's like a big gadget, like going yeah. haywire. But it's yeah, the shovel wasn't hooking up and looking up dead, bro. He was shoveling <laughs> some coal, man. <laughs> yeah, you know the, the ones you see, you, you can see they had gauges on them, and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're trying to figure out what the incoming pressure is, what the outgoing pressure is. You know, same as we uh, we do now. You know, so. <laughs> Justin said the donuts acted like a fire stop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, as the second alarm companies arrived, it was apparent that the theater could not be saved. The fire was extending to the row frames when the wall on the Johnson Street side of the uh, of the theater collapsed. Fire had extended down to two row frames, so you know the, the collapse intensified the fire, and uh, uh, it was an act of heroism that uh, was commented on and it was uh, on a, the cover of New York Illustrated or one of them. We got, we got the picture there. Uh, was a woman carrying a man on her back and uh, the man was uh, her agent and infer aged and infirmed father and she, she carried him out the back out of the theater and uh, it, was, it was noted by the firemen See, there it is. Ah, they don't theater. make them like they used to, huh, Roof? Look at that. That's a woman for you. <laughs> yeah. Come Put on. Man man over a back and dragging him out. <laughs> Come with me. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Wow. And, uh, yeah, the uh, the fire to, firemen saw her coming out of the front door, and uh, they thought it was very wow. well what she did. You know, um, The balconies were overloaded. You know, the, uh, it normally took six minutes to evacuate the entire theater, uh, but this wooden structure was being eaten away by the fire, right? You know, wood burns one inch every 45 minutes, right? And uh, so whatever's resisting gravity is being eaten away. And uh, eventually it, the, uh, the balconies collapsed. Wow. Uh, the collapse caused an eruption of flame from the rubble. Chief of Department Nevins kept his eye on the walls of the theater on the Washington Street side. It showed signs of weakness. It collapsed, which caused an increase in the fire. On the Johnson Street side, the, uh, it collapsed shortly thereafter. And then there was, a, you know, like we, we spoke about uh, fire as being entertainment for people when uh, we were talking about the, uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire rose certainly in place at this time. And, um, you know, there was a multitudes of people who were watching the fire as entertainment. And uh, the collapse made the assembled cry out. They were gassed because uh, they just realized that so many people were just killed. Uh, the collapse of the walls and roof occurred after about 30 minutes, 30 minutes, yeah, so uh, that's why we put 
red lights and sirens on these fire trucks. But <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take long for these things to try to fast, take chances. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. The uh, and the fire was placed under control at one o'clock in the morning. Wow. Uh, uh, Chief, I want to ask you. Um, I know it's probably prior to that, but when did they have those fire watches where you'd have a guy up at a tower somewhere spotting for fires in designated areas? Uh, I don't know if that was part of the paid service or that was. Uh, I had to be volunteer, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, because once they're on, that, that that's kind of like. Uh, could have used it that night, I'll tell you that. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> we could have seen that one from a while. <laughs> right. Well, every um, um, I lost my train of thought, but the um, it, it'll come to me. Uh, after midnight, the chief of department, his chief of department now, and a group of intrepid firemen went inside this uh, the hulk of this burning building. The first gruesome discovery was a woman who was who fell through the floor was badly burned, and. Um, uh, you know, she, that was uh, their first foray into what, what this was going to be. Uh, between 3 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning, Chief of Department Nevins discovered that the mass of burned, burned bodies in the cellar of the theater. Uh, they thought it was a pile of debris, and it was a pile of bodies. Wow. And they were all found basically in the same area, right? And one of, yeah. those, one of those diagrams you had, they were all in the same area. Yeah, yeah. Um, at sunrise, the, the, the illumination would enable the firemen to find a large pile of debris in the cellar. It was the remains of hundreds of people who could not escape. Many of the burned were so badly burned that they could not be identified. Uh, the undertakers from all over Brooklyn loaded up their buckboards with coffins and they went to the fire. So that, wow. that's how they removed the bodies. You know, they initially ladder two and ladder three were tasked with uh, uncovering the remains and, and they, they brought them out and they, the undertakers had these pine coffins and they, they loaded them into, uh, they had a makeshift morgue on Adam street. I think it was. Wow. Talk about uh, something that you can't unsee, right? If you're those, in, in yeah. Those oh people. my God. Well, and you know, like we said with with triangle, you know, uh, had they been ever been exposed to this kind of intense uh, sorrow and gruesomeness, you know, right. you had, uh, you know, it was closer to the Civil War, you know, but uh, I'm sure that the, you know, they didn't see this many people burned to death on, a, on such a massive scale. No. They said even the most seasoned veterans were disturbed by this ghastly sight. Um, they noted that two of the missing were well-known actors, uh, Murdoch and Claude Burroughs. Um, they were backstage when the fire took, uh, took hold and they retreated to their dressing rooms to get their coats. Tactical error. <laughs> Get your coat. <laughs> Get their Come coat. Come on, it man. Cold. It was cold. Yeah. yeah, I guess, right? How many times you knocked on somebody's door in the project or something and said, you got to get out now? And they're like, hold on, let me go get something. I'm like, you got to get out right now, man. You ain't got no time. I'm back to get yeah. his coat. Uh, Maybe it was a nice coat. Yeah. 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 Maybe he didn't get the memo about the secret passage. Maybe he had that, uh, yeah, what they was didn't that? get the message of the tunnel. Wow. <laughs> Maybe he had that diamond in the in the pocket or something. Wow. Like that. Oh, back to the yeah. Titanic that, reference, that, huh? Uh, illustration they just popped up. Uh, it showed the two coffins that you know they were uh, identical coffins, right there at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah. wow, uh, Bob, make that a little bit bigger. Those were the actual. Is that a photograph or a rendering? That was a. Uh, very few photographs that I got from this. Most yeah, I saw a couple in there. Or uh, illustrations. Yeah. yeah um, like a photograph. Most of the victims were from the family circle balcony, the uh, the uppermost balcony. Um, the cheapy seats. The cheap seats. Yeah. Yeah. That looks like an actual picture, I think. That is a picture. Yeah. There were there were no. Uh, nobody from the uh, orchestra. Um, seating the parquet. None of none of those people who were who were there were killed. Uh, they all got out. Uh, 
That's why that's why Ruffy pays the extra money to get the good seats. You know, you don't want to get caught. <laughs> well, and there was four hundred people um, in the uh, the uh, the uh, family circle balcony, and uh, you know the, the death toll was two seventy eight. So almost all the fatalities were from that it's, second balcony. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you weren't first out to down the stairs, you were uh, you were stuck. Yeah, yeah. So the, the blue uh, collar working Joe. Those are the guys who uh, yeah. she took a jackknife off the front uh, balcony. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the major newspapers at the time was the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, and they they uh, commented about the fire. The success of the firemen in confining the conflagration to the limits of the theater appears almost miraculous. When the inflammable nature of the structure and its proximity to other buildings was taken into consideration, that's uh, true. Yeah, we, yeah, that, that's what we just said. The police department, uh, the the police station, was all right. The, that hotel was all right. How the hell? How the hell did they do that? Yeah, yeah. The Unless only they were operating, but were those uh, row frames? Frame, you know, and uh, you, you know, can't do that at, now. If you stare at a row frame <laughs> long enough. It's like, <laughs> Give it a bad enough look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You drive around, you go to an area has a lot of row frames. It's a bad feeling about being. Here. Yeah, I love row frames. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, did they ever put anything back in that place? What the rebuild the the uh, uh, theater or just tore it down and what was left? I think they tore it down and that was it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but when the operations were done, two hundred seventy-eight people were killed. And unknown people were injured, and some were very seriously injured. Um, 103 people were so badly burned that they could not be identified. They decided to bury them in a mass grave at Greenwood Cemetery. And th this is the depiction. This is, uh, you know, the 103 bodies buried in this grave, you know. Wow. And, uh, um, uh, there was a mass funeral. Uh, on Saturday, December 9th. Uh, 18th. Wow, look at that. <clears throat> and it was bitterly cold. You know, buildings along the uh, funeral route were draped with mourning bunting, you know, the purple and black bunting, you know. Right around the, Christmas, you know, too. That sucks. The, the uh, thousands of people lined the route to pay their respects. Thousands, you know, and. Uh, um, the funeral started at one o'clock in the afternoon and was led by mounted police and the 23rd regiment and the 47th regiment of the U.S. Army lined the, the hearses as an honor guard. Uh, there were 17 hearses and 45 undertaker wagons carrying between one and four coffins each. So you just had them piled on one on top of the other. Uh, at the cemetery, a band played a dirge while there was a tolling of the church bells. Um, 103 bodies were laid in the circular trench at the cemetery. Uh, the city of Brooklyn would later erect a monument to the fire and those who lost their lives. The monument is located at the center of the mass grave and it still stands today. Uh, when I went there, I had one of my aides with me and we walked, we found the, uh, um the grapes we, we found the, the monument and we're looking at it we're reading the inscriptions on the monument and uh he, he turns to me he says where are all the graves i says you're standing on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is it this is, this is, what <laughs> this is it you know? and uh but uh hey, hey ruffy do you know where they have the one for the slocum they have a giant mass grave too where is it by grand avenue Right where we went to high school, right, right by Christ the King. There's a gigantic Evergreen, it's a, it's Evergreen a, Cemetery. No, that's um, all Saint faiths, all faiths, oh. all faiths. Right, but it's got it's a very ornate. There's a picture of a boat, and it's got. I oh, think really? it actually has their name on it too. So really, yep, yep. Now, was that a mass grave for for all the people, or just a few? I I don't remember offhand, but it was a, it was for a lot of them because there was yeah. a lot of. I'll try to get over there, and take a picture, and send it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, one picture I came upon, um, there was a uh, there was a theater fire in 1941 in Brockton, Massachusetts. The Strand Theater fire killed uh, 
killed 18 for Ironman. Wow. Injured 17. Holy you know, mackerel. This was a, like a trust collapse. You know, the uh, um, uh, Both strings. Fire, fire got up there and, and uh, caused the collapse and killed, killed wow. you know, 18 for Ironman. Um, did you want me to go into some of the teaching points of this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, the theory is defined in the building code is indoors, has fixed seating, has scenery, and has a fixed point of attention. You know, as you know, in New York City's building code, they um, they break them up as to outdoor seating, a church, uh, things things of that nature. Did this change, Chief? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Did this change because of this fire? Like, did this change in the city, any of the codes, or this it, it didn't happen right away? Didn't happen right away. You know, at the time it was, uh, um, this was the city of Brooklyn, so I'm not sure what they were doing. Ah, uh, I understand. You know? um, some of the problems with the Brooklyn Theater fire, or fire was flammable scenery, storage of flammable scenery, flammable curtains, a prosendium wall, uh, that uh, the wall that separated the stage from the auditorium did not go all the way to the ceiling. Locked exits, communication system, no automatic alarms, no automatic ventilation system, any adequate means of egress from the balconies, and no emergency lighting to be used in the theater. Emergency other than, lighting. Other than that, it was a safe place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really relaxed while I'm watching the show. You, you would have loved to go in there if they would have told you that, that, that this is what we don't have. You know, yeah. how could you sit in there and relax for God's sakes? But it is this this building was five years old. You know, it was probably state of the art when they built it, you know. Um Oh, I see the new code there, Chief. Under the thirty eight co building code. Yeah, the thirty eight code. Yeah. Um all right, how do we approach these? You know, this is uh Again, I, I leaned on um, the 9th Battalion. Uh, I got some good stuff from Vinny Dunn. I got um, uh, uh, Kevin Laval, who's uh, Lieutenant 56 truck, was a lieutenant in 4 truck for a while. And uh, I got some of the, and, and they're right in the heart of the theater district, Engine 54, Ladder 4, and the 9th Battalion. So they have a lot of good, good information about theaters and what to do with them. Um, they said fires in occupied theaters, there may be 500 or more people in the theater. Any confirmed fire in an occupied theater warrants a second alarm. You know, you, you can't get people there fast enough. You know, the, uh, and once people start exiting, you're not going to get down the street, you know. Um, if the theater is equipped with a sprinkler system, the sprinkler Siamese must be augmented. Because there may be, a, in addition to any time you're using a sprinkler system, it's got to be augmented. But there may be a deluge system between the stage and the audience. So that's going to require a lot of water. Uh, as is true with uh, with churches, fires in churches. You know, we were just talking about that. Most fires are likely to start in the stage area or the altar for churches. The stage area is where scenery is stored. It's where equipment, and flammable paints, flammable paints and lacquers may be present. Dressing rooms are also in the stage area. Fires are likely to start in the heating plant as well. It may be prudent to stretch the first hose line to the stage door instead of stretching through the front door to try to get through the exiting people in large areas. So hmm. don't necessarily go to where the people are. Go to where you think the fire is, you know. Um, under the 38 building code, the, uh, the following requirements were enacted. The prosendium walls to be a four hour rated wall and the prosendium curtain is held up by a rope with a knife nearby. So it could be used to cut, cut down. The Holy thing. shit. That's freaking awesome. So you gotta have a, you gotta have a knife. That's no, that's a knife. You know? no, that's a knife. <laughs> that's not a knife. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the ceiling. Acts as a heat sink. You know, it just draw, it just draws all that heat right up through, and there's nothing to stop it. As as is true with any wide open area without columns, suspect the roof held up by trusses, as the one in Brockton, Massachusetts. Um, and that fire happened on March 10th, 1941. Steel trusses in the theater failed. So, um, if the fire starts in a cellar, fire may get into the voids of the 
or in the walls. If that happens, the truss roof area must be checked. So just anticipate that that's where the fire is going. And, uh, you know, you got to check that for, for extension. And if that's true, get the people out as fast as you can and get out of there. All, no. all those all those theaters down there, Chief, they're all over 100 years old, right? The, all those theaters when you walk around there? And when I was in the 2nd Battalion, we had, you know, theater inspection that we would have to do once a month, you know. And, uh, you know, we had, to, we had to hit all the theaters in uh, Battalion 2's response area. They had, they had 13 off-Broadway theaters in, in, in the 2nd Battalion. So everybody focuses in on... Uh, uh, the, the what's main going strip on there. The, the, yeah. on 42nd Street and uh, Times Square, and uh, there's a lot of areas of the, of the city. Like I said, you know, Second Battalion and Greenwich Village, we had 11 to 12 theaters. You know, oh. um, you know, probably what, be the what, older ones, right? Because the city, yeah, built yeah, much downtown. smaller in scale, right? Than, yeah. You know, than uh, the big theaters, you know, in Times Square. But, well, most uh, of the like the one I just went to when I go see the Christmas Spectacular. The what is that? Radio City. Radio right? City. Yeah. I mean, it looks like most of that stuff is updated, but you know, yeah. who the hell you know? Can't, it can't all be updated, I would imagine. When I was a captain, they had uh, I, I didn't have a spot yet. And if you were SA, they they uh, so you, all right, you got to report to the Ninth Battalion, and you got two theater inspection, so you're on your own inspecting these theaters, and they had lock boards, you know, so. They had certain areas that were padlocked, and that they had to show a, a padlock on this board for every every door to make sure it's open. You know, and uh, is that right? Uh, Holy shit! Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the initial hose lines, unless the fires in the cellar, should be two and a half inch hose lines. You know, people ask about that all the time. Uh, so if it's in the cellar, you might have a harder time working, so you might get away with an inch and three quarter. But the theaters are, are wide open areas with high ceilings. The two and a half inch hose line should be needed to reach the balconies and the, and the ceiling. Keep in mind that a two and a half inch hose line is capable of extinguishing 2,500 square feet. Several hose lines may be needed. You know, so these are wide open, big, big occupancies. You know, and. Uh, so you may, may need several two and a half inch hose lines. Um, this is a classic communication between the incident commander and units must be clear. There is inherent confusion of what the exposures are. All units must be told where the front of the auditorium is and where the rear is. And it's the orientation of the communicator that makes a difference. For example, if you're standing outside the theater at the front door, you're standing in front and you're on in front and you're in exposure one. Once you step inside the theater, you're at sitting in the rear of the auditorium. Are you in the Yeah, in the right. Rear? Yeah, right. So, That's so, a confusing thing, man. Holy yeah, yeah. So you really it sounds like a simple thing, but you know, so I'm in the rear of the theater. No, you're not, you're in exposure one, you know. Um Yeah. What's what's in front, what's in rear must be made clear to those operating at the fire. Um the street in front of the theater must be kept clear. There could be no accumulation of limousines in the front of the theater. This will assist in the evacuation of the theater. You know, you have people coming out of this building, hundreds of people, and they're trying to, they probably just escaped something that was horrible. And uh, right. they, they, they tend to linger at the, at the uh right at the sidewalk in front of the building so you got to keep these people moving i was just going to say getting out of the christmas spectacular you, yeah you know you couldn't get out off the sidewalk there you know like you said everybody let out pretty much yeah. at the same time and we and we we waited i don't know one of yeah. the girls had to go to the bathroom so we waited you know they can't cross the street because of the traffic right yeah. getting back to what you just said so everybody stops waiting to cross the street so you you get backed up and before you know it yeah, it's it's. it's I can't down, imagine still in the auditorium trying to. Yeah, get yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. imagine. Like you said, if it was panic, forget it. It was. There's no doubt. It would be. Well, what crazy. about the way to the marquee on those? On a lot of those buildings. Yeah, yeah. they have a huge yeah. marquee there. That's that's pulling on that wall. Yep. Twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. You know, yeah. it's, it's just. Um, that's interesting. Know, stuff. The big thing with that, you know, that that's that was a big lesson from. Um, 
the uh, Third Avenue collapse in the Bronx in 1956. The uh, there was a marquee in this furniture store. You know, it was. Uh, I'm not sure if it was an old theater or what, but there was a big marquee on the front of the wall, front wall. And uh, come, firemen were told, you know, stay away from that that marquee. Get away from. Get out from underneath it. The big companies were to one side of it. It pulled down the entire wall. Yeah. You know, 48 engine lost three guys. You know, 44 truck wow. lost two guys, and his staff chief A uh, uh, was killed as well. So you had six guys in that fire. You know, one of the uh, crowning achievements of my tenure as a deputy chief was um, that I got a plaque to put on the wall of the the brand new building that was put there. Uh, commemorating the Third Avenue collapse, it's still the uh, the greatest life loss fire in the Bronx. Is that right? Third Avenue collapse in 1956. We actually did something very similar to that, Chief, for for the Maspeth fire, the soap yes. fire. Yeah, we, we had a plaque. Uh, the guys from uh, Hazmat and 288. We ended yeah. up getting a plaque put on there. We had a ceremony, and, and actually, some of the relatives of the people, the guys who died there. Um, yeah. They came down. It was it was pretty cool. So we did something very similar to that. Yeah, that. I love it. I, I, I love that stuff. I, I first had the idea. I was I was at the borough, and uh, Joe Wasnicker was the borough commander. I said, and I was told, him, I said, do, you, do you know what that was? I was right at the corner of Third Avenue of the Cross. Yeah, it's crazy, I, right? Nobody I knows. Drove, <laughs> I drove past it thousands of times. Nobody knows. I was in 46 <laughs> and 27. And... Uh, uh, I said we should put it. You know, they were building this building. It was it was just about to be occupied, and uh, I got the guy to uh, agree to put it on there. You know, and uh, so it was. Uh, like I said, that was that was before I was writing my newsletters. Right around the same time, hmm. and, as uh, it turned out, the guy in, in Hazmat, Mike Saro, he knew the guy who owned the built the new building on that site. So it was seamless. It, it worked out perfect. Yeah. You yeah. know, right, Coops? Is that right? If, if I'm getting something, right. I think Mike Sauer had something to do with it. Yeah, yeah he, had, he it's knew a the body guy. shop now. Or it's a body like shop. He yeah, knew the guy, body. and uh, <laughs> and it, that's that's how they did it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I, I love that. And like I said, a lot of these newsletters that I write, I like to go to the site and and just kind of wallow around in it for a little bit. You know, uh, feel and, the history. You can almost feel yeah, the history when you go to. This is this is where it happened. happened. Yep. And uh, I, have, I have a deep appreciation for that, you know, what happened in certain areas. And uh, when, when companies do put up a plaque like that, I think that's special. You know, well, true. when two crazy guys bop around Manhattan and look for old Tammany holes, stuff like that. To... <laughs> with a GoPro. <laughs> with a GoPro camera. With the microphone on backwards. Yeah, and yeah. The, uh, the Ludlow... Ludlow Street Jail is yeah, that, your high that's school. Right, I, that's where I took my fireman's test. Uh, yeah. That's right. He did. He sent me that. I sent yeah. that to you, right, Coops? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, <coughs> the um, a lot of companies must assist in the evacuation of the, the patrons. They keep the people moving away from the front of the theater. You know, small stops in the evacuation can greatly increase the time to clear the theater. Um, Life-saving operations of theater fires are labor-intensive. Full use of search ropes and thermal imaging cameras are expected. Um, skeds or Stokes, Stokes basket stretchers could be uh, used to assist in moving people quickly over carpeted floors. You know, that's that's a, a, a great tip. The uh, That is a good tip. The incident commander uh, should grab the, uh, the employee of the theater who has a certificate of fitness and he can tell what the seating plan is, what the public dress system is, what fire protection systems are in place. And um, it will greatly assist in his operation. Having information for the incident commander is vital. Um, emergency lighting. That's the one right there. That's is, the one. Um, gotta have that. You know, that's, you really got to focus in on that if you're inspecting one of these places of public assembly. And it doesn't have to be a major theater; it could be a high school auditorium. Got to have, got to have that uh, to make sure that the emergency lighting is uh, is up to snuff. Because uh, people who are seated in darkness and they're unfamiliar with their surroundings. Yeah, my goodness. Uh, that's that's a um, 
that's just an answer for uh, for Pat. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, recipe for disaster. You know what's yeah. so funny is until you said that they shut the gas off, obviously because mm -hmm. of the fire, and right. now they lost their lighting. You know, right. like in, in the movie theater, and you even my, my they just went to the movie. My my wife went to the movies the other day. Think about sitting in that movie theater, like you said, you don't know exactly everything until right. you know the show starts. Right, everything you could still see everything, but if that camera went out mm. and the lighting didn't turn on, it would be. You, they wouldn't know what to do. Like you, we would probably be able to get out of there because that's what we did. But yeah, if you're uh, choking on smoke it. and it's hot right. as hell in there and people are screaming. <laughs> and yeah. all those things. I'm saying just shut the lights off. They wouldn't know how to get out of there. Not even with smoke. Right. Um, that's crazy. I took this one course in, in college, um, fire-related human behavior. And I, uh, there was a, a professor named John Keating who... Uh, uh, wrote about human behavior in response to fire situations. And these could be um, easily applied to uh, people who go to theaters. Uh, under heightened anxiety, a person's focus of attention becomes very narrow and only allowing the processing of the most obvious elements of their environment. Uh, that's what, like we said, people, uh, you know, there's a fire going on. It's just, oh, I'm focused on... Uh, what that guy's doing, he's smoking a cigar, you know, yeah. whatever. Uh, during ambiguous situations, people will mind the behavior of significant others. Uh, that's why, if, you know, they say that one of the best uh, antidotes for a panic situation is to have a strong leader. Uh, if somebody steps up and says, all right, this is what's happening, follow me, people will follow me. So, um, People will revert to the familiar during periods of high stress. Um, you know, the, the place could be filling up with smoke because, well, I got to go to the exit that I came in. You know, there's an exit right next door to them. And they, they will bypass it. You know? um, An individual's cognitive processing ability is limited to emergencies, consequently. Repetition and brief representations about proper procedures are essential. You know, it's hard to get uh, people to drill. You're not going to drill with people, but but you might might get the, uh, the theater employees to drill, and you know maybe they could take some sort of leadership role. Um, slightly elevated levels of carbon monoxide can distort a person's ability to make proper judgments. So, you know, they may be lucid, and all of a sudden they're taking a little bit of a feed and. Couple scotches too, Chief. Probably, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they may decide to, uh, geez, maybe I can get an autograph from somebody. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice jugs. Look at that one. Yeah. I gotta go over there. Um, he talked about panic. This is, uh, he wanted further to write that people make mistakes in fires due to in inadequate information presented to them in a fire emergency. You know, that's why having that, that fire safety director to give instructions to the people. Um, their poor decisions are not based on panic rather than it's inadequate information. So, um, I wanted to say this quick. Uh, Bobby uh, Sonoff, 283, said the last fire tower in New York City was in Harlem's Marcus Garvey Park. The watchmen uh, were stationed there and would telegraph fires to the Central Telegraph Office. So that, that was what you were asking, Coobs. That was... Yeah. Uh, did you see that? I did. <clears throat> um, I, I I threw this up in the air to Vinny Dunn is you know because he was in the third division for such a long time, and he came up with a, a proposed standard operating procedure for New York City Broadway theaters. He said, upon arrival, units stand fast. The first ladder investigates and conducts a size up inside. If a fire is in the stage area, the ladder officer ens ensures that uh, an order is given. Uh, from the stage for all persons to leave calmly. Uh, drop the presendium curtain and assist in the evacuation. Uh, the first engine stretches a line to the sprinkler and standpipe systems and supplies the water. Second and third engine stretch a line to the reported fire location, avoiding as much as possible blocking the evacuating people. The second ladder climbs an aerial ladder to the roof to ensure that the skylight over the, over the stage has been opened by a fusible link, or if not, they will open it manually. The third and fourth ladder companies keep people moving and do not allow congregation in the sidewalks and streets in front of the theater. 
The fourth engine assists people moving away from the front of the theater to prevent a backup and blocking of people inside. Police assistance may be necessary. And the staging of all apparatus except for the first engine and the first ladder is on the avenues, not in the, in the side streets where the theaters are. This will keep the area in front of the theater open and will help prevent blocking the movement of people. Did, right. also, did, did the companies in the city, do they operate under this? Yeah, that... I, I believe so. Yeah. You know, I, I spoke to Kevin Lavelle and he said, you know, this is this is pretty accurate. You know, you know, they try to yeah, keep that's the first I ever saw that, actually. Yeah. Try to keep those people moving, you know, as much as possible. There's no doubt that about sounds that. Sounds like a common thing. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Your first in impulse is to uh, stretch a line into the theater. And really, that may be not the way to go. You know, you may have if the fires in the stage area, you try to go to the stage door, you know. There's no mandatory sprinkling system in this in these buildings, Chief. Yes, there well, is. No, there is. I'm sure. Nah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, they, even in the older they, buildings. Well, they focus on uh, uh, supplying the Siamese for the right. uh, standpipe and the sprinkler, and the uh, the deluge system might be a, a thing uh, that your theater is equipped with. You know, so that requires a, a lot of water. Yeah. I would imagine all those buildings have been updated with sprinklers i mean i don't know I, I, I would imagine they are yeah hmm. well like i said it's you know if you're if you find yourself detailed to an area that's got theaters man check that emergency lighting you know check to make sure that the uh, fire protection is good you know the uh stamp pipe and the sprinkler system is and that's good. once a month they go to these inspections huh <clears throat> yeah wow and they go to them like an hour be before showtime Oh, is that right? Like they're not showing up at nine o'clock in the morning. They're showing up like at you know show right time. before the show, right? Right. Show right. time is seven o'clock. They're there between six and seven. Oh shit! So that and they're they're checking to make sure all of the exit doors are unlocked and uh, get the, a few numbers. The fire safety director, <laughs> uh, who has a certificate of fitness, he has a, a logbook that he has to sign into, and and uh, he affirms that everything is you know unlocked and all the uh inspections have been completed you know so that's a spicy meatball if you're signing that off huh you better make sure everything is done right yeah 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 and and every theater has this logbook and uh you know it, it, it's uh if something goes wrong you know you want you're to on the hook. Everything, everything is okay with you know that, that you saw you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. Mm. Yeah. All right. So that's it. That's the Brooklyn Theater Fire. Loved it. That was. Oh, wait a minute. I was going to pull it, but let me do this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chief. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. And we're going to call you again. Oh, yeah. We're going to keep. I love this stuff. What What do you got in the What do you got in the hopper? Oh, I got a lot of stuff in the hopper. Oh. <laughs> I just have to go down and find it. That. <laughs> That did you did you do thing. did you do the the Masbeth fire chief? The soap yes. factory? Yes, I did. Maybe we might do that one. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I got kind of is the history goat. Got some pretty kinda. good pictures of that, you know, and uh, you know, a couple. That was a marquee, right? I don't want to say, but that was a marquee collapse, right, or something? If I remember right, I don't even remember. I don't remember. I think, I think it was, but we'll uh, dust up before we I'm, talk I'm about. Sure, it. I have your. Uh, you sent me most of the. Uh, Newsletters, so I'm gonna go through that yeah, how, again. How about maybe yeah. sharing a couple of those with your buddy over here, you know? Yeah, crap out. You're cramping up on me. <laughs> All right, we want to thank the chief for coming on. We want to he and our, our producer got a new name. He's called Mick Bob right now. So <laughs> I like Mick Bob. Mick Bob will be coming back. Don't worry, we're not gonna let him go too far. Uh, so we have those other two uh, lackeys coming in. We got Gonzo and the uh, the Tankus. They'll be uh, producing the show. Uh, Ruffy, you got a shout out? Uh, I don't have the information in front of me. Do you have it? Uh, I don't. I think uh, McBob has it. <laughs> I just last see that. I love that. I don't have the information in front of me. Hold on. You should have told. I thought you were doing it. I, I thought it was to you. Oh, I thought you said I was okay. I spider. thought you said spider, spider. I don't have my phone on me, spider. <laughs> Hold on. All right. Well, we're, while I'm looking this up, we're going to be uh, – where are we going this weekend? Oh, right. we will be at the um, Long Island show 
at the Nashville Coliseum. So come out and see me and the Rufopotamus live and in person. We might be drinking in the booth. Who knows? You never know if that happens. But that'll be uh, Friday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday. No, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday. Nassau Coliseum. Where did I send this to? And also, I wanted to give a shout out to. Um, hold on a second. I don't have the exact information. I'll just uh, off the top of my head. Big Johnny Albanese sent me and Ruffy uh, some old early 1900 journals from the Housewash FDNY, and I was very, very touched by what he sent. So, Big Johnny Albanese, we thank you, kid. And uh, someday soon, Ruffy's gonna fall. I gotta get the uh, I'm looking the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 I sent do, it to do, you. Do, do. I, no, I said, I thought you said, all right, Anthony, firefighter Anthony Morrow, he died, passed, passed away January 27th, age 34, uh, from cancer. Um, he's survived by his wife, Alexandria, daughter, Chiara, and son, Anthony. He was diagnosed with brain cancer in 2020 after he suffered a seizure on the job. Terrible. Terrible. Rest in peace, brother. That is a line of duty, correct, Ruff? Uh, Yeah. I'm going to give him the five bells for the line of duty. Rest in peace, brother. All right. Four. My goodness. That's too young, bro. Yep. Chief, thank you so much for coming on. Your granddaughter is so cute. She's a little (laughs) absolutely adorable. And uh, we'll be reaching out to you again. Okay. uh, Hopefully, it won't be like uh, at the 23rd hour, you know. Or like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got Chief Leap coming up. Not. We got, oh, we got Wednesday. Chief Leib. Wednesday this week, not Thursday. Chief Leap, great guy. Ruffy and I work with him. Had some really good fires he wants to talk about. And like I said, uh, for, just for now, we'll say goodbye to uh, McBob, but he will be back. I can see him in the back room. Now, look at him. He's giving me the cheers. I'll give him the little cheers too. Here's to McBob. <laughs> and here's another one for McBob. Go. go home and get your shine box. Now go home and get your shine box, McBob. <laughs> we will see you on uh, Wednesday this week. Until then, Leatherhead Nation, stay low and go. We'll see you soon, Chief. Thank you very much. We'll see okay, you at the big one, everybody. Be well.